When it comes to race, everything is different. Everything. A few months ago, a very enthusiastic uh, reader of my books and follow and, and viewer of uh, our, our our videos called me up. He said he wanted me to restart this podcast, the one you're listening to now, because he was going to invest let's say a good chunk of money in it, you know, more than you would invest, say, going to Starbucks. He was going to invest a good chunk of money in it. He wanted to build a special website. He wanted to spend a lot of money promoting it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I said, okay, that's great. Sounds like a great idea. But you know, when it comes to race, everything is different. Because his plan was to go hire an agency. To, to, to do some of the things that would really boost the uh, visibility of this, this broadcast podcast. He goes, no, it won't be any problem, Colin, no problem. He went out and found 10 to 15 agencies and talked to every one. He found agencies that probably won't be open next month because their business is doing so poorly. <laughs> they refused that they refused money. To, to, to work on this podcast. A lot of money. Everything is different when it comes to race. Everything. I, I used to do a lot. I used to spend a lot more time doing PR than I do now. I used to write a lot more commentaries. I used to send them out to a lot more daily newspapers. Uh, I used to send out stuff to talk radio. I'd write an article for American Thinker or I'd do a video and I'd send it out to this place or that place. Say, hey, uh, you know, why don't we do a story? Why don't you do a story on that? I'll help you. I'll, I will, you know, that's a story. And I'm the guy who knows more about it in the United States than anybody else. So sometimes people would, you know, I mean, that's the way it works in these things. Sometimes people, they don't, I'm not really into it. Other times people would send very, very definite, uh, nasty notes saying, you know, offering offering me to, you know, one obscene ex- suggestion or another. But there were, I'm surprised at the number of times, especially among the big boys, where you, they'd say, okay, yeah, let's do something. And, uh, 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 but it never happened. I'm thinking of uh, the New York Times. I got called to, an interview with the New York Times once. So we're up there talking, talking. And after about three minutes, after it became clear to this guy that I had at least as many notches on my little journalistic belt that he, as he did. And, uh, you know, I was not some kind of uh, wild-eyed guy carrying the Confederate flag to start a new white separatist nation in Idaho. Well, the story just kind of fizzled away. I had the same thing happen with the Atlantic Magazine. Uh, But I did get to see the inside of their offices and the World Trade Center. And what is probably the world's nicest cafeteria up there on the 40th floor with an unbelievable view. So that's worth something. No, not the Atlantic. That was the New Yorker. Sorry. Uh, Ditto for the Wall Street Journal. The Wall Street Journal. They uh, they used to have a rate. Okay, this is the this is like the punchline of the story. I'll put it first. They used to have a radio show. And when they were doing their radio show, they called me up. They were doing a story about the knockout game. And so my thing is, you know, you're going to get the bad news up front when you talk to me. And so they were taping an interview. I said, blah, blah. Yeah, this is a black thing. Knockout game, black on white, black people targeting white people, Asian people, young people, old people, puppies, whatever. And I knew all the time that if I had just done the urban thing, the teen thing, I, you know, I could have had my book mentioned on this big radio station I, uh, network, and I could have gone this there and that way. But I mean, that's that that really that really would have missed the point, right? That that on what we do here and and outside of here is we talk plainly about race, without racism or rancor or apologies. So as I was telling this guy the bad news that this was a racial thing, a black on white thing, black on young, black on old, black on gay, black on straight, black on Asians, Eskimos, Amish, kitties, puppies, and turtles, I could feel the energy seeping out of the interview. You know, it's kind of like when you call one of your girlfriends up and says, hey, it's Colin. Would you like to go to the movies with me? Or maybe we could go down to the Wawa and get a cup of coffee. 
all of a sudden on the other end you hear this like enormous amount of disappointment <laughs> like oh no colin i'll be busy uh that night and uh yeah every night that every night for the next like 12 years okay thanks i'll call you then that was that's what it was like talking to the wall street journal on the radio it was like for the first minute I did my little spiel, and then for the next four minutes, all it was was the announcer being polite as he could be without getting into my face about it because I knew that interview was never going to air. Six months later, that radio station was off the air. That radio show was gone. Everybody who interviewed me or produced that show was gone. Good Lord, you fellas almost did something interesting. Gasp! Now, the Wall Street Journal, one of our viewers tells me that uh, a couple of days ago, the Wall Street Journal had a big article on racial violence in Missouri, except it's white on black violence. And apparently it happens all the time, everywhere. That explains everything. There's white racism in Missouri that are, people are always messing with black people. That's the violence that got the NAACP to say, we're going to boycott Missouri. Guess what? Well, the Wall Street Journal did a big story saying, hey, we looked at every one of these incidents and, uh, well, none of them are really true. So I guess it's good that the Wall Street Journal is starting to figure some of this stuff out. But I have to tell you that, um, by and large, a lot of the conservative media is kind of absent from this whole, from this whole, I don't want to call it a fight. Let's call it a fight. This whole fight to be open and honest and talk frankly about this ridiculous level of black crime and violence. I mean, I was just at that, what was it called? Night for Freedom. I'm going to another one in Washington at the end of this month or February 24th. The Chinese guy stood up, Chinese immigrant guy stood up. And I think he asked Mike Cernovich a question. He was like the host. And they asked Cernovich a question because my grand, my uncle doesn't like black people. What should I do? And Cernovich went into this long explanation of how this guy, your uncle had something wrong with him inside and he's just projecting his own deficiencies on black people and that's why he doesn't like them. Okay, well, that's when I got up and walked out. Nobody really cared, but I did track down that guy afterwards, the, the young Chinese guy who, who, who asked the question. And I, I told him, I said, listen, I've done more about black on Asian violence than anybody. And next time you see your uncle, I'd like you to ask your uncle this question. Has he ever had any experience with black crime and violence? The guy goes, I don't have to, I don't have to ask. I already know. He, he owns a store. He owns one of those little convenience stores, or he used to. And he said it was an everyday thing. And so, and so, I mean, there's lots and lots of conservatives who still are talking about urban this, urban that, and if we can just get enough jobs down there, all this crime and violence will just go away, and this black and white hostility will go away, and then, you know, all will be well. Yeah, I'll tell you one guy who's not absent from looking at this business right in the eye. One guy for whom everything is not different. One guy who takes the same common sense and piercing insight into the human condition and does not exempt anybody from it, including black people. That's Jesse Lee Peterson. I mean, I did the show this morning with him, and I hope you got a chance to check it out over on his uh, 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 his podcast, his network. But one thing about Jesse is. You know, he just reminds everybody what the causes and solutions are. Remember, I don't do causes and solutions because they're usually a deflection. Jesse's the exception to that rule. And so Jesse just talks about this catastrophic conditions inside the black family. No fathers. Guys coming in and out. Welfare. No working. Unbelievable levels of drugs, violence, alcohol abuse. Every other indicator of dysfunction, whether it's financial or educational or lifestyle, is just completely out of whack. Jesse will just sit there and go, listen, you created this crazy state where 70-some percent of black children are born out of wedlock, and now you want to come by and see why why there's so much criminality among black people? 
I mean, you're even denying it now? And so that's Jesse's mission in life is to remind people that it's not about welfare. It's not about economic opportunities. It's not about better schools. It's not about over-policing. It's not about free this or free that. It's about some very, very basic and fundamental things. It's about God. It's about family. It's about things that bind everybody together in a wholesome way, in a good way, a way that lets everybody grow. I mean, and and so, you know, and so if I don't say, I probably don't say this enough. When people say, Colin, Colin, what, you know, what are you going to do about this? I said, don't ask me. That's above my pay grade. Go listen to Jesse. Causes and solutions. I'm right in the middle. All I'm saying is this is happening. I don't have any idea why it's happening or a little bit, but I don't really do the solution thing either. But Jesse is better than that on anybody. I mean, I've done hundreds and hundreds maybe more than hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands, talk radio interviews around the country, including some big ones, or Sean Hannity, Sean Hannity a bunch of times, Alex Jones, Jim Bohannon, um, lots and lots of other big stations and big markets. And ditto for art, where my articles have appeared. I mean, I was writing, I was one of my articles used to appear at a website. I, I just won't even, you might know it, but I just won't mention it. I mean, this was a website where it's known as a conservative website, but was also known as a place that, uh, you know, used to, let me see, how do I put this delicately? Well, they would, they would write articles saying things like Obama was a homosexual or Hillary Clinton's going to be in jail in two weeks. This is while she was secretary of state or that Obama's going to seize power for a third term by call it, canceling the election, um, all that kind of stuff. And those articles were just run period, like headline, author, article. But whenever they ran an article by me, it was always like headline, author, and about a 10-line explanation of why they have to run this article about black mob violence and black racial violence and black criminality. So even that was, everything's different for them. So one of the things that Jesse Lee Peterson talked about this morning was I mean, how can we just ignore this catastrophe happening inside the black families and think people don't come out of there completely, I don't know, tarred and bruised and battered and ruined? He was talking about how because, you know, the father's absent and this is happening and that's happening, people come out with daddy issues and mommy issues that soon enough they convert into I hate white people issues. And we were talking, you know, maybe that's a word we should bring back, issues. Because nobody uses it that much anymore. But, I mean, we we talked a little bit about that story that was on Vice and HBO, at least 10 black women. Uh, Vice and HBO followed them to Costa Rica for a black-only retreat. And you put the camera on them, and one woman goes, boy, I'm really glad there aren't any white people around here because now we can be honest. And then everybody just went on to describe how much white people suck. But missing from that whole segment, which we did, I actually think we actually talked about this on a podcast, so I won't dwell too much on it. Missing from the whole segment was like, okay, you have our attention. We know white people suck. Can you tell me why? What did they do to you? And one lady goes, well, they used to say they liked the way I talked. They said I was well-spoken. Another lady goes, they always wanted to know about my hair. Another lady goes, I didn't like gentrification in Brooklyn. That's it. That's it. That, so that's your stated reason for this unbelievable level of racial hostility and venom that you feel like you can talk about as long as there aren't any white people around to overhear what you're saying, that's it. There's no rape. There's no murder. There's no robbery. There's no random beatings in the parking lot. There's no white people running through your neighborhood shooting at people. That's it. All you have is white people were trying to be nice to you by complimenting you on the way you speak and by... Um, 
and, and by asking questions about your hair. By the way, that woman's hair is like one of those all day hairdo things that cost hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars. That, you know, if you do that, if you sit in a hairdresser's chair for that long, I mean, let's face it, that is an attention-seeking behavior. So if somebody pays attention to your hair and all of a sudden you take offense offense at it because they're white, that's not about your hair. That's about these crazy issues you picked up as a child. This is what Jesse Lee Peterson is so good on. You have issues. You have mommy issues, daddy issues, and all of a sudden you transferred them into high-hate white people issues. Why? They asked me a question about my hair, Colin. That's why I have to go to Costa Rica and tell everybody how much white people suck. You know, I read a quote by Thomas Sowell the other day where he said, listen, we can't stop somebody from saying bad things about you. All you can do is show them that they are liars or show them they are wrong. But when we when it gets to this level of black on white hostility that we have reached in this country, which is now mainstream and easy to find on Vice, HBO, NPR, CNN, MSNBC, the major networks, New York Times, all the major dailies. When that get when that level of black or white hostility rises to the level that it has, then all of a sudden we have to start asking the question, at what point does the hostility become a precursor to violence? Well, that happened a long time ago. Of course, hostility is a precursor to violence. I'm not saying every, every person that's hostile is violent, but every person that's violent is hostile. And where, and where do we see it more than the tip of the spear The cops that have to deal with black people, every single one, I believe, is pretty much suffering a textbook case of PTSD. I'm going to get back to the cops in a minute. That just reminded me of something like, where are the psychologists? Why does it take Colin Flaherty and Jesse Lee Peterson to say that there's unbelievable psychological damage being inflicted on people in this ridiculous way that they're being raised in homes without fathers, homes without this, homes with drugs and alcohol and criminality, in neighborhoods with intense violence. Where are the psychologists? Where are the psychologists psychologists when college professors in political science go out and give lectures on PTSD, politi- you know, post-traumatic slavery disorder, that everything wrong with black people is because of slavery. Where are the psychologists? Aren't they even around? Where are the, where are the economists? Where are the finance people? Aunt Coulter was very good on, well, she's good on all this stuff, but she was very good on this, reminding people that being a single parent is pretty much a guarantee of poverty. you have a kid out of wedlock, especially if you're a younger person, you just pretty much guaranteed your child an, a, 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 a reserve seat on the treadmill into some ridiculously lousy life. Where is that? No, all we get is people on, the N- on NPR reminding us that white people suck because they're always messing with black people because of something that happened in 1492 when Columbus sailed the ocean blue. And nowhere do we see this expression of black and white hostility with more enthusiasm, with more damage than the black and white hostility directed at cops. This morning I saw where I saw somewhere where it was supposed to be a favorable statistic where it said something like, um, you know, cops are Black people are 18 times more likely to shoot a cop than a cop is to shoot an unarmed black man. See, I don't like that term, unarmed black man. I mean, Michael Brown was unarmed. Does he fit in that category? Was Michael Brown a threat? He was when 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 he grabbed for that guy's gun in the car. Was Michael Brown a threat when he put his head down and started charging office, that officer like a bull? 
Was he a threat? No, you put him in the unarmed category. Column. For no reason whatsoever. The violence on cops is now... It's almost like that's the de facto response. Show up on somebody's door, knock, knock, knock. Hey, we got a warrant for you. Or hey, we just got a 911 call. Or hey, uh, what's up with the... Uh, you know, what's up with this thing that you're accused of doing? Can you please come with us? Boom, 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 boom. The guns start blaring. Just like these stories. You could hear a woman crying for just a moment before that call disconnected. A search of the number by the dispatcher revealed that number belonged to a Candace Smith, the wife of the man now identified as the suspect, Quentin Smith. And this wasn't the first time she'd called 911 in fear of her husband. So officers quickly responded to what they thought could be a potential domestic situation. And once they arrived on the scene and came into contact with the suspect, gunfire was almost immediately exchanged. And then... Candace Smith called 911 again. She told the dispatcher she was hiding in the bushes outside her home. Take a listen. 911, what's your emergency? Please help, please help, please help. What's wrong? Tell me my what's going on. He shot, he shot the police officers. Your please husband did it? Hurry where's your husband now? My daughter now? is in there, please. Okay, where, yep, sorry, yep. where's your husband? Well, Crosswind Drive, I don't know, but my daughter is in the house. Please, she's one years old, please. Officer Eric Joring, a 17-year veteran of the police force, he died at the scene, while Officer Tony Morelli died at the hospital later in the day. He was a 30-year veteran of the force. Both men are being remembered as heroes, guys who did their job the right way and gave their lives in protection of others. A GoFundMe page for the two men's families at last check has raised over $180,000. Now, I mentioned that this wasn't the first time that police responded to the Smith home to investigate domestic violence incident reports that we've obtained from the Westerville Police Department shed some light on the suspect Quentin Smith and the tumultuous and troubled relationship he has with his wife Candace. In fact, we learned that last year Candace visited the Westerville Police Department. She was inquiring about getting a protection order against her husband. She said that anytime she threatened to leave him, he threatened to kill her, their daughter and himself. And she told police he always had a gun nearby. This noon, police across Georgia are mourning the death of one of their own. Locust Grove police officer Chase Maddox was shot and killed, serving a warrant yesterday. We are now learning more about the suspect who shot Maddox and two Henry County Sheriff's deputies. Channel 2 Steve Gelbuck is live at the GBI headquarters in DeKalb County, where an autopsy is being performed right now. And Steve, the officer's body will be moved back to Henry County this afternoon. At some point, escorted by fellow officers, the body of Chase Maddox is going to go from here to that funeral home back in Henry County. Not sure exactly what time that's going to happen. At the same time, the GBI tells me that they still need to interview the two surviving deputies to find out exactly what led up to this shootout. A small memorial forms this morning outside the Locust Grove Police Department for Officer Chase Maddox, killed in the line of duty. Two Henry County deputies survived after being shot inside this home. A neighbor told me she heard what sounded like firecrackers. Pop, 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 pop. But Dory Kistner, who lives just across the cul-de-sac, knew they were gunshots and called 911. And looked out the window and saw the heavy set officer running away, going ouch, 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 and feeling himself for wounds. That was Deputy Michael Corley, shot in his bulletproof vest that saved his life. Kistner also saw Deputy Sig Calloway, where he dropped just inside the front door. The one with the head sticking out of the door frame and the guy that came running down. I didn't realize there was a third officer inside. He never made it. No. She never saw Officer Maddox or her neighbor, 39-year-old Tierra Guthrie, both dead inside. She confirmed these are photos of Guthrie from his Facebook page. The father to three young boys, the youngest just a few months old, is also a Marine veteran, and drove this truck parked in the driveway. But neighbors hadn't seen the cab move since the baby was born. All three kids were inside the house at the time of the shootout and are okay. But the entire Locust Grove community, family, and one of his closest friends mourns the loss of one of their finest. Couldn't say enough <laughs> wonderful things for somebody like Chase. 
I did speak with the GBI this morning, and once those interviews with the two surviving deputies are complete, they'll expect to release more information about what led to the gunfight and uh, was really just uh, serving a routine warrant for failure to appear. But the motive could be connected to the no trespassing sign we saw posted by the front door and a Moroccan flag there as well. Other symbols I found on the suspect's Facebook page. And Detroit tonight, a deadly standoff in Detroit is over, but not without a tragic loss of life and injuries to police officers. Three women were killed in the rampage, two sisters and their niece. Two Detroit police officers and an off-duty school officer were shot and wounded. The gunman also killed himself in a standoff that dragged on for 14 hours. 7 Action News reporter Kimberly Craig is live with how it all played out on Detroit's northeast side. Such a tragedy. Hearts are heavy, I'm sure, tonight, Kim. Absolutely, Carol, and this has been so incredibly devastating. It almost sounds surreal. And for the victims' families, many of whom live here on Lamont Street near Outer Drive, nothing will ever be the same. Speechless. Couldn't think about anything. I mean, just nobody can imagine something like this happening. Nobody. Family and friends of the victim shock. Police say a 61-year-old woman, her sister, and their niece were all killed by the niece's live-in boyfriend. He's 49-year-old Lance Smith. As you know, this suspect showed and demonstrated that he was uh, dangerous. A relative says Patricia Wilson and her sister Barbara went to their niece's house last night to check on her. There was an issue with her boyfriend, Lance Smith, but Patricia and Barbara were shot and killed outside. And when Patricia's husband, an off-duty police officer with Detroit Public Schools, heard the gunshots and went to see what was happening, he was shot in the leg. Two Detroit police officers were also shot when they responded. Police say Smith barricaded himself inside the house and continued to shoot at police. Well, we do know there are seven guns registered to the location. There are a rifle, what appears it was used in this assault, but many guns associated with the suspect. Shortly after noon today, Michigan State Police used three robots to go inside the house. That's when they could see Smith's girlfriend was dead and he had shot and killed himself. Detroit police now trying to figure out what set Smith off. A man with no police contact before today, leaving three women dead and shooting three police officers. Some family members, some friends made statements that he acts uh, peculiar at times. I just want everybody just to pray. I mean, you know, everybody, everybody pray. I want you to ask your friends to pray, their friends to pray. I mean, because something like this happen, you, you lose three family members in one day. It's unheard of. Deputy Gum was killed at 88th and Dawson. Officers already arrested one of the suspects. We're a little more than nine hours from when this all started. It is still an active scene as deputies search for two of the three suspects they believe were involved. One of the suspects again was arrested after Deputy Heath Gum was shot. What we know is this started out as deputies responding to an assault call on the southern edge of Thornton. The Adams County Sheriff's Office says when deputies got there, the suspects took off, leading deputies behind a house in this neighborhood and that is when deputy gum was shot in the chest again those suspects took off as deputies worked to help their fellow deputy and track down the suspects deputy gum was rushed to denver health medical center it's a level one trauma center that is equipped to deal with serious injuries he was pronounced dead at the hospital deputies searching for the two suspects had to deal with the news of losing one of their own it is believed those two suspects are armed and dangerous. Officers were able to find the car that they think the suspects were in. They found that in North Glen, but obviously nobody was inside. People are already paying their condolences outside of the Adams County substation this morning. Into the early morning hours, the community came together to watch a somber procession from Denver Health to the Adams County Coroner's Office. Nine News reporter Anusha Roy was there. Their purpose for being here yeah, to come out and pay my respects are the same. I live a few minutes away from where this happened. Their reasons why born out of respect. My life was saved by a police officer two and a half years ago um, and I can't thank him enough. I, I wish I can give him everything in the world and it's hard. It's hard to see them go through this. You know, if you look up the street as far as you can see, there are officers. And even in this dark moment, Sudi Floyd, whose daughter is a police officer, took a moment to observe. They're like a family. They come and support each other and everything. And I think if we acted like a family, maybe this wouldn't happen as a, as a city. So together, they waited. It's the second time in just a few weeks that something like this has happened. And together, 
they grieve. They put their lives on the line every day for people like me. And watch the line of officers that stood still begin to move, going one by one from Longmont, Sheridan, Aurora, Broomfield, and the Adams County Sheriff's Office. You're in my thoughts and prayers. And as I was making this podcast, as I, as I was buffing it and shining it and polishing it and getting ready to post it, I get an email from Chicago from a cop who says one of his fellow cops was just shot in downtown Chicago near the state building. And yes, it was one of the fellas. That cop is now dead. Wow. Wow. And of course, we can always count on Newsweek to remind us what's really at the bottom of all these attacks, black on white attack, cop attacks. U.S. police shootings reflect structural racism across the states, study finds. God, I'm so sick of these studies from these, basically these like, the equivalent of mail order colleges. Somebody comes in and goes, hey, can I have a, a couple hundred thousand dollars, or maybe you know a million or so. That ought to do it. That'll cover it because we're going to do a story about how uh, structural racism is really is really eliminated. Uh, the whole idea that black people can be responsible for their own behavior. So we're going to we're going to prove that black people are not responsible for their own behavior. It's not their fault. Oh, you're going to give me ten million for that? Oh, great. Thank you. That's not too much different than how the academic world works. Newsweek, you know, Newsweek, of course, trumpets the findings. Yay. Oh, it's unbelievable. White people are always messing with black people for no reason whatsoever. That's why cops are always shooting them. It happens all the time. It happened just five minutes ago. For no reason whatsoever. And for every 100 of these stories, we get one story going, well, you know. Okay, maybe the black people were breaking the law when they had this encounter with the cops. Maybe they were threatening the cops. Maybe they were shooting the cops. Maybe they had a gun and they were running away and they pulled the gun on the cops. How many of those videos have you seen here? Oh, you lost count? So did I. People have issues. Not just black people either. I don't even know what the white people's issues are that make them go and crane, make them go insane where everything's different. I mean, who went crazier over the last two years than Starbucks on the issue of race? Remember, it was just two years ago. Starbucks did their race. I think it was called Race Together. Somehow, the baristas at Starbucks, when you went to get your cup of coffee, they were going to write something on your coffee and a cup and you were going to have a discussion about race. Whether with yourself or her, or him, or somebody in sitting next to you. I don't know how that was going to work. All I was thinking about was, man, if I'm in line and the person in front of me starts getting into one of these discussions about race, who's going to get good old Colin his cup of black coffee? That's my issue. But Starbucks abandoned that for a couple days after just a day or two. They, they kind of just spent all this money rolling it out. They're going to take a leadership position in doing this. We're going to change the world with our coffee shops because we're going to show you white people how you're so messed up around black people. I have to confess that when this Starbucks rolled this thing out, I was kind of, well... Okay, I shouldn't take joy in the, del- in the you know pain and in suffering of other people But I had my schadenfreude on full blast that day because I knew we were going to have an endless supply of videos involving Starbucks. Not that we have any shortage now. I just knew our our viewers, our our readers, our listeners to this podcast were going to take their cameras in, tilt their cameras over to landscape uh, orientation, turn it on, and ask the barista, hey... Last night, there was a home invasion a mile from here. Two white people got killed and a bunch of black people are are in jail. What's up with that? Why is that black criminality so wildly out of proportion? I knew we were going to get that every damn day. I mean, 
but, and, and, and so anyway, Starbucks abandoned that, and I was all sad. I was all sad because we were already compiling a list. And we've done many stories here about black criminality in the Starbucks. Directed at Starbucks. And so let's hoist Mr. Schultz, Howard Schultz of Starbucks, by his own petard. What did you do, Mr. Schultz, to encourage these black people to break into your store 30 times in one, one, little, you know, one little part of Atlanta? What did you do, Mr. Schultz? You're sitting there so busy about telling the rest of us how deficient we are in our racial attitudes, but they're targeting you, just like this story said in Atlanta. For the first time, police have identified suspects in a series of robberies targeting Starbucks customers. Good evening, everyone. I'm Jovita Moore. I'm Justin Farmer, and police told us about uh, five different crimes at four Starbucks around Metro Atlanta. Tonight, Channel 2's Nefertiti Jacquez obtained surveillance pictures showing the suspects. Neff with us live in Buckhead. And Neff police want to catch these people badly. Justin, they do, especially because at this hour they tell us they don't know how many suspects they're dealing with and they don't know if these guys are connected to all of these crimes. Meantime, take a look right here behind me. Police say somehow someone managed to remove an entire piece of glass in this latest case and they went into the store without tripping the alarm. It's, it's very scary. Deborah Schwartz Griffin was surprised to learn that thieves recently hit the Starbucks on West Pace's ferry that she frequents about three to four times a week. Police say someone broke in January 29th without triggering an alarm. It angers me too. It makes us feel that we're um, very vulnerable. This is just the latest in a series of Starbucks robberies and some criminals targeted customers. It's a shame that something like this is going on and it's, it's hit us in a common place that we all love to go. Atlanta police have at least five confirmed cases. The first at this Starbucks on Piedmont Road on December 12th. We've obtained these exclusive pictures showing the suspects on surveillance. They casually walked in before swiping laptops and making a run for it. A similar crime played out in a Starbucks in Buckhead. I can't even imagine how exactly they actually get away with it. Police don't know if the customer robberies are tied to the store break-ins, but the Starbucks on Monroe Drive has been the target of both crimes. Early January 24th, suspects removed a glass from the metal door frame, made their way to the safe, and got away with a few thousand dollars. That was actually my first thought. Why, how on earth would they be able to crack a safe? Why Starbucks in particular? That's another, that's another good question. As we come back out live, we can tell you Atlanta police are reviewing lots of surveillance video, trying to piece all of this together. Meantime, we also tried to reach out to Starbucks via phone calls and emails, but we have not heard back from the company as of yet. New developments today in a series of burglaries at Starbucks across the metro area. Police say they caught one of the suspects who could also be responsible for dozens of burglaries in Fulton, DeKalb, and Gwinnett counties. Channel 2's Mike Pachenik broke news of his arrest. Mike's live in Dunwoody with the missteps that police say helped catch him. Mike. Uh, Jovita Dunwoody, police tell me they got a call early Tuesday morning about a burglary going on here inside of this Ashford Dunwoody location. When they got here, they say they found two men running into the woods behind it. We received reports of a burglary in progress at the Starbucks in front of Perimeter Mall. Dunwoody Police Sergeant Robert Parsons says his officers rushed to this Ashford Dunwoody Starbucks Tuesday morning. The alarm company saw two individuals crawling around on the floor on the surveillance footage and called it in immediately. When cops arrived, Parsons says they saw two men running into the woods. At that time, we requested a canine unit respond from Doraville Police. After a short chase, he says they caught up with one of the men, Quadir Johnson. Parsons says detectives believe Johnson and his accomplice have been breaking into Starbucks stores across Fulton, DeKalb, and Gwinnett counties, including at this one the other day at a Sandy Springs location. We have heard reports that it could be over 30 uh, involved. If, if, in fact, they are connected, it would, you know, several, several burglaries. That's awful. Customers told us they're surprised to hear about Starbucks as a target. Why would you break in somewhere? my Starbucks. You try to have a business and someone comes in and, you know, steals from you. You know, that's, it's hurtful. Kay Sullivan says she's glad police caught Johnson. He should spend some time in jail. Don't let him out. Okay, I'm going to break about a million rules here. Rule number one, don't put anything on your podcast that is going to sound to your listeners like Colin running his fingers down the blackboard. Screech. I'm going to make an exception here because this is Howard Schultz talking just a little bit, and he talks for hours about this. Just a couple of minutes of the CEO of, of Starbucks talking about how 
Black people are relentless victims of relentless white racism all the time, everywhere. That explains everything, especially why, well, especially why he is so eager to relieve black people of responsibility for their own behavior. I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, in the projects, federally subsidized housing. Living in the projects, you're living among a very diverse group of people, African-Americans, Latino, every religion. And from an early age, I learned very uh, good lessons about living among a lot of different people and getting along. And the understanding uh, that I did not see color uh, or any issues whatsoever with race as a young boy. It was imprinted on me early on that we live together as one. As I look at the current situation in Ferguson, New York, Cleveland, and for that matter, the rest of the country, with regard to racial tension, racial inequality, the unfortunate situations between police uh, and, and people of color, I think there's an outcry of, of action that is required by the citizenry of the, of the country, as well as the government. And that is to reach out and try and create a better level of understanding, compassion, and most importantly, empathy of what it means, in a sense, metaphorically, to put your feet in someone else's shoes. Well, just in the last few months, uh, having these town hall meetings with Starbucks employees that we call partners in Seattle, Oakland, St. Louis, Los Angeles, New York, and now here in Chicago, has really demonstrated to me that there's such a longing and a hunger for people to have a conversation, to share with one another their own life experience, and the power of vulnerability, because it, 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 it is a catalyst for empathy. And I, I just don't think this is a time where I, uh, or for that matter, many people in America should be a bystander and let this go, go on, that we can make a positive difference with, the, with our families, our children, our neighbors, in recognizing that we can live together. I think most black people and most white people want the best for their families and, and recognize, most, most of us recognize, we can and should live together in harmony. All of these forums have produced a high degree of emotion and they've all been the same. And that is when you unleash the opportunity for people in a safe environment to talk about their life experience, their concerns, their vulnerability, and in many cases, racial injustice, it produces a high degree of empathy. As a result of all of these forums, uh, I'm very proud to say that in partnership with USA Today, we're gonna create this program in which we start developing a tool and a resource under the title of Race Together, of providing insight and information and education to the readers of the USA Today, to the customers of Starbucks, and, and I think it can be a very positive catalyst for conversation and hopefully uplifting change in, in which people recognize that there are, there are things that we could do as private citizens to move the country forward with regard to this issue. We have to all live together. I've learned in my own business at Starbucks that a diverse workforce of being inclusive of people who are different than you are, different ideas, different life experience, creates a much better conversation and in terms of business and my own private life, a much better outlook on the, on the challenges we all have. Uh, I look back on 1968 on what Martin Luther King tried to do and what he accomplished and I think about where we are today and I'm, I'm sad to, to come to the conclusion that we haven't made much progress and for many uh, who are living on the other side of the tracks who feel there's a sense of hopelessness and conscious bias against them, they feel as if we've gone backwards. I think there's a time in the country where there's such polarization and dysfunction in Washington that it requires businesses and business leaders and the citizenry, citizenry of the country to recognize that we have to come together and do all that we can to try and make a positive difference uh, and not be a bystander. 
the gifts of America are not an entitlement. We have to earn it. And I think this is a time in the country we must recognize that going down this road of such racial tension and racial inequality is not going to serve the nation well and certainly not going to serve the people well who feel a sense of hopelessness. So it's not only my childhood that imprinted me with a greater understanding and sensitivity of these issues, it's where I am today in terms of my company. Starbucks Coffee Company has stores in every community in America. We're serving millions of people every day and it's, it is a very, very diverse group of customers. And I think we have an opportunity to engage in conversation and leverage our national footprint and our scale for good. Everything's different when it comes to race. And when it comes to Starbucks, it's probably 10 times more different. That means we need a lot more clips. When we run a few of these clips that we haven't seen for a while about black criminality at Starbucks and why there's never a barista around to answer the question about why that's happening when you need one. In a perfect world of perfect objectivity, we wouldn't have favorite stories of black violence and denial. But I'm sorry, I just can't help but smile very broadly whenever I think about what Starbucks did last year. Remember when they started that big campaign, Conversations on Race, and how long that lasted? How many days that lasted? One, two, or three before they closed it all in? I think a lot of I think a lot of uh, customers were saying, hey, what's up with all this black crime and violence? I don't think Starbucks liked that. But I also knew that at some point after, the, after that big conversational race, Starbucks was going to have a lot more questions they could not or did not want to answer. What about this little episode in Chicago? Customer goes in, gets a little coffee, comes out and gets killed. How about this episode in Philadelphia? Stop at this center city Starbucks at 16th and Arch turned into a violent encounter all caught on video. I found myself looking forward to all these conversations with baristas or at least hearing about them. When people would say, hey, what's up with all this uh, black mob violence and black on white crime and black criminality at Starbucks? What's up with that? And having the baristas explain to us race had nothing to do with it. It was all about a bunch of other stuff. And just because black people were involved in this wildly out of proportion, that is just a coincidence. It's the world's greatest coincidence. That's the kind of stuff you think of when you ingest the world's most popular psychoactive drug, coffee. And oh yeah, it just happened again, this time in Peoria, Illinois. At 446, we've got some breaking news in Peoria. That's right, police right now at the scene of a Starbucks where they're investigating something that went down. Something that went down. When you're a hot chick on local news, that's the kind of stuff you can get away with saying, and no one will ever notice. Mark Liverman is live near 75th Avenue in Thunderbird with what we know so far. Good morning, Mark. Good morning. Yeah, what we know so far is this was some type of an armed robbery. It happened around 3.30 this morning, and it happened right here at this Starbucks, we're told. Uh, you can see a number of police cars still on scene. There were a couple more earlier. Those cleared out probably within the last five or ten minutes. But what we know so far, and we haven't been told a lot, uh, there was a safe that was not taken that was inside that Starbucks, uh, but the contents inside the safe, or at least some of them, uh, were taken at gunpoint. Uh, we're told uh, this is an armed robbery, but nobody was injured. That's what they know uh, so far. In terms of suspects, I asked police on scene just a couple minutes ago uh, how many suspects were involved, what they looked like. At this point, they say uh, they don't know. They haven't been able to release that information. And you can actually watch. It looks like possibly one or both of them are now driving off. But the investigation, of course, continues, guys. And as soon as we get more information, we will bring that to you. Three episodes of black criminality at Starbucks all in the last two to three months. I think they recently opened a Starbucks in Ferguson, Missouri, eagerly awaiting news from there as well. 
I've been in a lot of Starbucks, a lot of times, all over the country. I've never seen a white person do this. Oh yeah, they did catch up with the guy that caught up with, with his description. It indeed was a black person. Do you think it's time for Starbucks to reinstitute their little converse, conversation on race? If so, I'd be happy to donate a few copies of that scintillating bestseller that might help the baristas out a little bit. You know, I guarantee you, when you, when you work for Starbucks... You don't get a company that grows so exponentially fast as he did without setting up some really high standards and making sure everybody lives up to them. You don't get any credit at these big corporations for trying. You only get credit for setting goals and meeting them. They don't have meetings where you sit around and go, yeah, I told you I was going to sell, you know, a million dollars worth of stuff, but we only ended up selling a hundred dollars worth of stuff. And I know you've already had plans where you're going to take that million dollars and use it as a collateral for some loan somewhere. So, hey, sorry about that. But, you know, I had a bad week that month because of 400 years of slavery. Do you really think Starbucks listens to excuses from their employees? Somebody serves Colin a cup of cold coffee when it's supposed to be hot. Do you think Howard Schultz wants to hear that sob story from the barista? No, because he knows that unless they have standards, they're not going to have a company. But all of a sudden, when it, come, when it comes to black people, everything's different. When it comes to race, everything's different. Black criminality, wildly out of proportion. Oh no, black people are not responsible for that, Colin. You know that. Black crime and violence off the charts. Well, Colin, that's really your fault because you are you are a white racist and a bad person. Even though I don't have any way of knowing that's true, it kind of sounds good, doesn't it, for me to tell you that? I mean, that's how, that's the world he's living in now. Some people, when they get very successful, and there's even actually a book called this, it's called From Success to Significance. They made a lot of money. They've made a big difference in the world. All of a sudden, they stick their chin up in the, in the air and they decide, boy, you know what? It's really great living in this $50 million house with 26 servants and I don't have to wash my own car anymore. I don't even know how to drive a car anymore. But man, I really would like to to, to take it to the next level and become a spiritual leader, a guru, a person of significance. Whew, man, those people, those are the, some of the most dangerous people on the world. Who do you think is funding all these crazy groups? Not just George Soros. Ford Foundation, they, they're always giving money to any kind of crazy group that rolls along and goes, yeah, black people, man, they're just not responsible for their own behavior. That's why the crime and violence is so out of proportion. So could you give me some money and we'll, you know, we'll make sure we organize so people recognize that fact. And Ford Foundation is like, they can't write you a check quickly enough for that. Black Lives Matter. Oh yeah. Black people really suck. We can't do this. We can't do that. We're not, we're not responsible for our own behavior. Oh, Washington Post, New York Times, NPR, every other major media outlet in the country. Can you do a story about my book saying that? Except, you know, just don't forget the part where you blame white people for my own deficiencies. Wow. Do you think, do you really think we can have a society whose central organizing feature is everything can be different for black people? They don't have to take responsibility for their own behavior. Listen, I know taking responsibility, 100% responsibility for your own life. Good Lord, there's nothing more difficult on this planet. But once you do, there's nothing more satisfying because if you're doing this, if you're doing the well, Colin, I'm only like 10% responsible for my own behavior. That means 90% of your life is out of your control. You don't have any control over your life whatsoever. But as you get to 100%, it has to be 100. It can't be 99.99. .99. As you get to 100% responsibility for everything that happens to you in your life without excuses, that's an empowering feeling because if you're responsible for it, then you can change it. Then you can make a difference. Then you don't have to wait on anybody else coming in and going, okay, Colin, I happen, I'm the guy who was responsible for 90% of your life. That's why your life was so deficient, Colin. Now, 
uh, if you just, uh, you know, be real nice to me, say some nice things about me over the next 10 years, maybe I'll crank you up from 10% to 20% responsibility. But even so, most of your life's going to be out of your control. That's a central organizing feature of life for black people in America now. Shirking responsibility and handing it over to people like Al Sharpton and Jesse Jackson. Wow. Wow. Maxine Waters. Wow. Hillary Clinton. Wow. Cory Booker. Wow. Every, they all say the same thing. Of course, black people have to shoot cops. Because they're not responsible for their own behavior, they have issues. That's why we got to let them go. Everything's different when it comes to black people. How's that working out for us? How's that working out for them? Not too well. But even saying that, pretty much guaranteed to make the black kids angry. <laughs>